go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I'm your host, Fadi Kudair. And we are joined today by one of my favorite people at the gym. Oh, that's sweet. Antonio Pinero yeah. from Ingressive Capital. Capital. Yeah. So Ingressive Capital. First off, mm -hmm. let's start about your, a little bit about your background. Okay. So yeah, you're right. My name is Antonio Pinero and you're probably wondering, okay, how do I have a Portuguese last name and a Spanish sounding first name? Yeah. But I'm not, well... And you're neither, innit? And I'm neither. <laughs> neither no. Yes, I am Nigerian. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria for all my life. And then I went to the, came to the U.S. for college at 16. Did my undergrad in economics and finance at Wichita State, Kansas. Then I pivoted, to, then I got my MBA. Then I worked in the agriculture industry, selling grain silos to the Middle East and Africa and mm -hmm. Western Europe. So I got to visit Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Germany, <laughs> while selling grain bins all around the world. Then I moved back home to Nigeria where I run a civil engineering firm, helped them scale from building homes to doing large commercial buildings as well as plants and, you know, really getting them into that oil and gas industry that's really big in Nigeria. Yeah. And then I pivoted to tech, joined Andela for, Andela is one of Africa's unicorns. I joined a tech operations in Nigeria, right there, Series B, helped them scale to Series E, so led the expansion within Africa. At my last role there, I was responsible for 1,600 billion engineers working on 400 clients, which is about $176 million in annual revenue. And my goal was to make sure that customers were happy. <laughs> wow, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So just for folks that are watching, mm -hmm. when it comes to investment, and we're talking about you said, yeah. unicorns. Yeah. What are the what are the unicorns? In Africa or globally? So unicorns are essentially is a company valued at a billion dollars. And and that is essentially the sign that you have made it, mm -hmm. right? And how these companies get their valuations, well, now it's probably different, but back in the day, let's say like 20, 20 2021, it was like a like a ten x multiple of your revenue. So if you're generating about a hundred million dollars in annual revenue, multiply by ten, you know you're at a, you're at a yeah. million dollars. So that's what a unicorn is, and it's at that point where a lot of companies do tend to go to the market and try to IPO mm -hmm. um, because then they can get a lot more funding and people who have invested get to you know cash out, essentially. Fantastic. How did this go from that to <laughs> ingressive? Great. So, like I said, I am. I grew up in Nigeria. I'm a very proud Nigerian, and I I personally believe that Africa is the next frontier. The reason one hundred percent. It's always yeah. been the frontier. It's always been the frontier, but it's taken Africa a while to get there. Yeah. Right. So, if you think about right now with the advent of the technology, the average age of Africans is around thirty five. In Nigeria alone, the average the, the population is originally around twenty. So it's a very young population, mm -hmm. and they're growing in a time where technology is like it's just everywhere. Yeah. So you have people on the continent who, because they have a lot more mobile penetration and internet penetration, are teaching them, themselves how to code. And I got to see this in my time at Andela, where we had an, a, 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 one of the people who had taught themselves how to code. Because they went to the Andela program, they were able to start earning $150,000 while living in Nigeria. Which is from novel, I wouldn't <laughs> think about it. Exactly. We're the cost of living. Exactly. So like their life and their family's life has changed. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot more stories like this. And what happens when people start to make a lot more money is they start to look at ways to improve their lives. Um, which is where technology comes in because this has led to a lot more companies building in the fintech space, real estate, real real estate, logistics, health tech to serve the needs of this growing population that is now earning, you know, foreign currency. Yeah. As, and that's led to a technological boom. So we see a lot of more companies coming up in in the economies where these are raising, and they're seeking funding, which is where VC comes in. Uh, because, as we all know, venture capital, you put money into a business to scale. It's cheaper than going to a bank because it's a longer term. You're taking ownership. There's no concern about making interest payments. Yeah. So you're essentially giving these aspiring founders money to really scale and grow their businesses and you get to you know rip good rewards to put it in clear terms if you're looking in the u.s and you want to invest in a business a founder could come to you with a great idea of what they're doing on the market this might just be a, an idea on a business plan right they haven't done anything they haven't generated revenue there's no traction they might make like maybe a hundred dollars a month and it's valued at 10 million dollars and people are like throwing money and they're like, we want to get in because it's the next big thing. Take it to Africa. You have a founder who is bootstrapped, raised money from, in, from an angel family. 
he's probably generating ten thousand dollars a month in revenue, and that company is valued at five million dollars. So if you look at U.S., no traction, ten million. Africa, traction, <laughs> five million. Yeah. Or some say it's even two point five million. So you are able to get in, and the beauty about the continent is when we make these investments at this five million dollar valuation. As the company grows, when they get to like the the next level, like the seed and the Series A, Series B, their valuation is now comparable to the U.S. So, for example, a company we invested in at a one point uh, two point five valuation got acquired by Stripe for two hundred million dollars. Wow, that's <laughs> that's like a good cash out day. It was a good, yeah. It was it was beautiful, and we're seeing more and more of those stories. And yes, right now the economy is bad. Things are, people are a bit like hesitant to invest. But if we think about through history of the world, whenever things will get tight, that's where you see the new innovators come out mm-hmm. to create businesses that are sustainable and are meeting the needs of the people. So my job as a venture capitalist is to find those right entrepreneurs and invest in them and back the right one and provide them with the framework and the resources to help them be successful. Yeah. Well, they say also something to be said about the the need being the mother of all invention, right? Like if you need something and you're strapped for it, well, I'm just going to figure out a way to make it happen. Exactly. (laughs) If I'm trying to get this door to latch a certain way and I'm just going to try to figure something to make it work. Exactly. And and beauty about it is, I'm not sure if you migrated it, but I think you did when Mm -hmm. we spoke about it. But, you know, as a minority, as someone coming from the continent, just the act of getting the U.S. visa or Canadian visa, it's a grueling process. Tell me about it. <laughs> right? You have to send all these documents. Yeah. You have to prove that you're not trying to run away. Now, take that to, I want to raise money. <laughs> right? And so, you're like combining two two evils at the same time. <laughs> exactly. So for this entrepreneur, as it's, they need to know, like, look, I can't, I need to show that I am a trustworthy person. My business has an actual need. I It's a sustainable business. And I'm not going to run away with your money. Mm-hmm. And for them, it's not a, okay, fine. Like, I'm going to start this business and I feel, yeah, I can fall back on, there's no government support, <laughs> right? No. It's like, this is my ticket to change my family's trajectory. This is like my legacy. So you see the amount of grit and perseverance that you see from these founders is very different. So that's what makes it even more exciting to really back this founders. Like one of the founders that we recently backed last year built a platform that lets people create content, like educational content to sell. So it's called Class. And essentially it's everything you need from video to payment to scheduling. Literally took all the top platforms and my to one. Yeah, similar to like Kimba or something. Yeah, Kajabi. Similar to Kajabi. Kajabi yeah. It was built for the <laughs> continent. And he's generating significant revenue and we got in very early, and that business is just growing so fast. And yeah, and it's only going to grow faster, especially he's for, twenty. For that. Everything is online nowadays. Yeah, and he's twenty. Wow. <laughs> so it, it's like it, it, it's just a fascinating market to be in, despite what you might. I think Africa's biggest challenge, two of them, is one. People say Africa, but Africa is fifty-four countries. Yeah. So where in Africa are you speaking about? We focus on Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, Morocco, Ghana. Oh, look into Francophone Africa. We don't invest in all of Africa because we're not that. <laughs> we like, that's a lot. That's one. And, the and, second- and those, it like, and again, coming mm-hmm. from someone that was born in Egypt, it's, mm-hmm. it's, those are the countries that are really are producing. Now. <laughs> exactly. The rest are, don't get me wrong, they're still trying to get there. They're not there yet. But they're probably 10, 15 years behind. Exactly. So that's one. And the second thing is, a lot of these countries don't spend a lot on, the, on PR. Right, like they you don't have the money to spend on PR, bro. What are you doing? <laughs> exactly. Bootstrap this and get it done first. Exactly. So, like, if you think Egypt, for example, right, the infrastructure in Egypt is actually one of the best on the continent. But you wouldn't know that, you know, when people think about Egypt, they think about oh, the pyramids and the pharaohs and but, the camels and the camels, right? But Egypt is actually one of the top tech hubs on the continent. Mm-hmm. Like Amazon goes to recruit from Egypt. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's probably one of the highest, second highest per capita when it comes to uh, engineers. Exactly in the world. But you, unless you are in that industry or sector, you would not know this. Yeah. And I think, and that applies to a lot of African countries. Is you hear more about, oh my God, this 
bad stuff is happening and you believe it, but you don't know about the blue sectors in there. I mean, would you believe that Meta, Google, AWS all have presence, uh, presence in Nigeria? They also have presence in Kenya. They also have presence in Egypt. These are the top companies. Would you know that they're almost like, it's, it's just like, and this is not oh, like a sales office. These are companies that have like made investments in the tech. Oracle has been, Oracle and SAP has been selling on the continent for the last 20 years. Yeah. And Oracle, <laughs> we, we all know how he is when it comes to Oracle, right? Like very <laughs> sales oriented. Yeah. But ruthless leader in a way. But they have, and the beauty of it, like for them to be successful, they've had to partner with businesses in like, on the continent mm-hmm. and to deliver, right? Yeah. And these businesses have made a lot of money and now they're putting it back in the continent. So that's what, that's what makes um, Africa really exciting for us to invest in because the money that you have here also goes, the money you invest also goes a lot further. Right? If I invest $500,000 in a company in Nigeria or in Kenya, the currency value, the currency um, arbitrage gives the founder a lot more to do with versus $500,000 in Canada or the U.S. Yeah. It's also because it gives the show because of the labor force being on a lot cheaper rate. Mm-hmm. Affordable. Affordable, <laughs> you know, in a way, yeah. uh, which is a lot, lot more affordable than here. Like, for yeah. example, it's a, give you a very simple example. When yeah. I get some of my video edits, I outsource them. Yeah. But I outsource them to where it's supposed to be cheaper. Right. And the, quali- horrible. And the quality is still the same. It's just as good. Yeah. If not, sometimes better. Yes. And they have the more time. And I actually would pay them for more time because, you know, you realize that it, but with more time, you get better quality too. And then you, and the, the beauty about it is like, and that's, that's why we invest in content because this person is probably working with you and 10 other people from their home and they're generating for, for an exchange. And as a result, they have a lot more free money and they wonder, okay, how do I make my life better? So the tech companies that are providing their needs, because if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is food, health, stuff like that, like it goes through. We're seeing the younger generation of Africans, they want more. They don't want to move abroad. They want to stay on the continent. They want to live their lives. So you start seeing businesses that mirror companies in on the West popping up, right? We have Uber Eats and DoorDash here, but on the continent we have Chowdeck. I, I, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. It's just like I've always been saying this. Mm-hmm. Africa is the birth of humanity. Yeah, it is. And if we, if we don't go back to spending more on Africa and really just oh. focusing on that, we're going to lose humanity in a way. <laughs> so I actually think what's happening is a lot of people who know about the continent don't want, don't want to to know about it. And the reason being, about two years ago, the continent was really hard. And there was so much money that came into the continent, which is great. The challenge is if you're going to invest somewhere or get into something, we have this saying in, in Nigeria, follow who, follow who no road. So essentially, you follow the person who knows what they're doing. I wouldn't come to Canada and say, okay, I have money to invest in Canada without working with somebody who's been in Canada, who understands the culture, Correct. who understands the business environment, who understands the regulation. Yeah. Yeah. What we had happen was a few people came in and they'd meet a founder. They'd love, they take the Western idea of how business works and brought it to the US. Okay, I believe what you're saying. I'd give you money. So as a lot, as a result, a lot of businesses that didn't, they shouldn't have gotten funded, they'd get funded and people got burnt. And when we get burnt, they're like, oh my God, you know, Africa is not sustainable. I don't think it is. I don't think that's the story. It's the real story is just like any market of global expansion, you didn't understand the local context. And that's why, like, how we set ourselves apart. So the majority of our LPs, those are the investors in our fund, are larger VC funds who have an interest in the continent and use us as a seed of fund to say, okay, what's happening on the continent? We should be back. Or family offices who are looking at the continent and want to understand a bit more. So a company we invested in recently uh, from our first funds, Carry First, it's a game publishing company out of South Africa. And in the last two rounds, Dresden Horowitz, A160, one of the biggest VC funds in the world, invested in them. Sony just got into partnership with them as early as last year. Oh, wow. But you wouldn't hear about the stories. No. <laughs> right? So there are things that are happening on the continent that are major. But once again, like MNT Alan, which is based out of Egypt, did their first IPO 
uh, the, a billion dollars, I think, early last year. Wow. <laughs> right. And so those companies like this that and do exist, and you they do, they do exist, about you know, because you're about them. And, and that's what gives us an advantage because we're on ground and we understand what is happening. We're able to identify where to make this investment and your returns. So, like, my, my, my funds, our funds, in, like, strategy is simple. It's like we get in at a $5 million valuation. And when the company gets to Series B, which is around hundred and two hundred million dollars, we get out. It's a forty X return. <laughs> and that's within a space of five to seven years. So that's so, yeah. It's a huge <laughs> return on investment for you know yeah. five to seven years for sure. Mm-hmm. What in in your opinion, what makes a great company a good sort of investment? Oh. It's it's a honestly couple of things also with external it has to come down to what 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 is what are you solving right are you creating a i like to use this analogy and <laughs> like it, but it's like are you creating a a vitamin or a painkiller without like, taking away the the western context um and on the continent most people don't buy vitamins because it's like it's a nice to have i don't need it. i can get from my food but everyone buys painkillers because when they have a headache I need to have my painkiller just in case I have a headache. So I always buy it, right? So if somebody is building a business that is solving a real need, that is sustainable and pan-African, like scalable across multiple countries, that makes it very attractive because a lot of these, a lot of the African countries have, are at similar stages and have similar problems. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to scale across industries. That's one. Second thing we really look at is the founder. What's the founding team? We invest a lot in diverse teams, and diverse teams can go from gender to um, education to background because we believe that diverse teams, and it's this, there's data on this, so diverse teams actually produce better results. We you know, hey, what's that tunnel vision of, okay, if you both grew up in Nigeria, you, know, you have two men on there, they're both founders, and they went to the same school and everything, they're going really to think the same way. Yeah. But if you have a man and a woman, different perspectives. If you have one man, two men from different tribes who grew up in different, you know, sectors or women different sectors, like that brings a lot of diversity. So it's more about looking at the founding team and their business because when you're investing that early, the truth is the founding team decides what's going to happen in the business. They're going to have to pivot, right? Nobody comes out and says, okay, this is what I'm going to build and it's going to be successful. As the business encounters each different challenge, the founders have to have that flexibility in their mind and grit to pivot to what the market is saying. You know, they have to have that foresight of, okay, fine, things are not going so well in this market. Where should we move to or what should we switch to? Do we have the right product market fit? How does this work? So yeah. the founding team is for most of our decisions. Like everything can be right, but at the founding team, if we're not, if we don't believe in that team, we don't invest. Well, it's hard to believe in somebody that you don't necessarily believe in themselves to start before <laughs> right. they don't have that pedigree that you guys are looking for. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's very interesting because you you meet all types of personalities. Like you meet the founders who are very opinionated, very strong, but also very intelligent. And then one of the things that we started looking at, it's just being built. I know a lot of people don't believe in psychology and the metrics, but like sometimes is that an introvert versus an extrovert, mm-hmm. right? How do they communicate? You know, what is their back? story and why is this problem really important and why is this something that they want to solve right and those are things that you know you try to paint a picture of the entire person beyond what's on paper and you know you only talk to people who know them you look at the background you do your own research because that because at the end of the day you're investing in a person yeah and and, and you also like especially <clears throat> for your position or like where you guys are at you know your position there as a company is mm-hmm. you've got all of those investors that are relying on you to do all of the hard work. Yeah. Like I said, we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> I'd love to kind of, uh, you know, keep doing this, but obviously yeah. Antonio's got to go. He's got a uh, board meeting and the yes. many other things today. <laughs> uh, and I really appreciate that we both can make the time to oh, make thanks, this bro. work. And thank, uh, you. thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having for me. folks that are watching, hey, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe so you can get more and more alerts about episodes like this and people that are uh, doing fantastic things in the city of Ottawa and abroad. And if you like anything specific, comment. Let us know. And uh, if there's any business that you think of, let us know as well too in the comments and we can interview them. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Antonio. All right.